Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the next edition of Thai Mumbai's webinar series. We again have a great speaker today in the form of Niren Shah. Uh, talking to him will be none other than our own president, Atul Bai, Atul Nishat. As you all know, Atul Bai is the founder and chairman of HSAV Technologies. He is also currently the founder and chairman of Ascent Overseas Education. He also run, runs his family investment business in the form of TechPro Ventures, where he is the founder and chairman. He has been the past chairman of NASCOM and is an active member of NASCOM today. And most importantly, he's been a prolific and a very, very active member of Thai Mumbai and a president of Thai Mumbai and helping us and all the startups as always. Over to you, Atul Bhai. Please take the session forward. Thanks. Thanks, Naveen. Uh, first of all, um, indeed, my pleasure to welcome you, uh, Niren. Niren Shah is a managing director and head of Norwest Venture Partners in India. Uh, he is uh, quite an expert in digital businesses, having worked in eBay, uh, as well as uh, 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 eBay, he worked as a global strategist. And uh, he also worked with Bazi.com in India, which was acquired by eBay in 2004. And then later on, he chose to move from Silicon Valley to from the digital space to the investment space and uh, took over as the MD in India of um, uh, Norwest. Last 11 years, he has been making investments. A number of them are... Uh, very successful in the prominent investments, paperfry.com, Kotak Bank, Quicker.com, Swiggy.com, just to name a few, and also Chola Mandalam Finance, and several more uh, companies that we would prefer to hear from Niren later on uh, than my talking. Uh, when, um, during his studies, he was gold medalist, masters in commerce from Mumbai University, and also rank holder chartered accountant. So join me in welcoming Niren to this uh, webinar uh, to just give a slight background of how we'll proceed. Uh, initially, I would request Niren to give his brief comments uh, for next 10 minutes or so about uh, how he sees the situation today, uh, if we were to divide the uh, scenario into three parts, the first part being current lockdown scenario, which we don't know how long it will continue, maybe 15 days, one month or more, we don't know. Second will be when lockdown is lifted, but it will still not be safe period. People will still have a lot of fear, social distancing, etc. And then the post-vaccine era when we would be more free and confident. But economies would have been bruised, businesses would have been hurt badly. And then it's a question of rebuilding both economy and businesses. And then what will happen? So these are the three phases. Uh, we couldn't have had a better person than Niren to share his thoughts and guide all of us as to how uh, he thinks the situation and share his vision to all of us. And after that, we'll start, after he shares his thoughts, we'll have Q&A. And uh, I'll take up various questions that I've already received from many of you who have sent earlier and also those who will be sending during the chat. And thanks to all the participants who have uh, joined us uh, today uh, for this Thai Mumbai webinar. Over to you, Niren. So thank you very much, uh, Atul and Naveen. I really appreciate being here. It's really a privilege. My association is, uh, with Thai has gone back to the Silicon Valley where I used to head eBay Strategy and Venture Group. Just by way of introduction, like uh, Atul Bhai said, I run Norwest in India and uh, Norwest is about $9.5 billion under management. Uh, our latest fund is $2 billion. And uh, in India, we've had about 40 companies. We do both venture capital and uh, what we call private equity or growth equity. And uh, we've had the privilege of having about 25 exits uh, of about $1.2 $1 billion. 
uh, on investments uh, which we have made up in 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 india are approximately 700 to 850 million dollars um and 700 million till about 2 years ago 150 million in the last 2 uh, years so yes we do sit on boards of many companies and it is truly my privilege here today to be sort of sharing uh, some of the responses to your questions i think the first uh, sort of question which everybody asks today is about covid and the impact and i think uh, that's one of the reasons we're doing this so i'd say that look i mean this is uh, definitely once in a generation uh, crisis i think all of you are going to hopefully there will not be such big crisis again and hopefully you will be telling your children and grandchildren about what happened in covid and how we did not go out for 60 days or whatever else and uh, and at some point of time it will be a romantic story and this will be way behind us and at that point of time and hopefully that's not that long and what i will call the long term things will all be back to normal and it will be very hard for you to remember this time i actually write a diary i call it the covid diaries i want to remember what i ate for lunch what i ate for dinner and how many steps i took uh, because i do all my calls on while walking so i would encourage you to remember this time it's not a very positive time uh, on multiple levels uh, but certainly one fine day you know this will be gone hopefully and uh, you know and things will be good that was the positive side of uh, this story then we have three phases in my mind there's the short term there is the sort of what i call the intermediate phase and the long term in the long term i actually genuinely feel that there is not going to be a better place than india to invest it right? across the ages across time this is india's time next 25 years and you know and i i call the long term basically after the intermediate phase so let's talk about short and intermediate phase right in the short term i'm basically looking at the next two months right if you're in mumbai you're already hearing of uh, cases are becoming large uh in south mumbai there is a you know they're taking over clubs uh you know they're, they're for quarantine facilities and there is a lot of expectation that like amdabad there may be a lockdown things like that we don't know for sure but effectively uh you are seeing that uh, the cases are increasing and in the very short term i'm afraid i am not very bullish the worry is that when you look at the data and let me tell you what the data is for me any country which has gone to close to 4000 cases has also gone to about 7 8000 cases and if you look at a you know per gdp per per population data by far india has done a fantastic job for all the people you know who are you know very upset with the lockdown please do remember i personally feel that the government has done a fantastic job because we are a very different country from the rest of the world we have a lot of people and we are a thriving democracy with small houses lot of people joint families and this is not something which is going to be easy to control if you look at the covid you know you know the the uh, <coughs> the, the problem is it is under the radar the covid you know strikes under the radar for 7 8 days uh, you may not even know that you have covid and what it does is is it comes a significant challenge for you to figure out what has happened to covid right so i think the challenge in the short term for us at least is that it is spreading and i actually think and i think a lot of people have mentioned this that the peak will come sometime in june or july and which means that we are going to see much higher numbers unfortunately because no country under lockdown has actually grown this fast right so despite a full lockdown pretty stringent lockdown the country has still seen a lot of cases and then once you reach 4000 no country has not seen 8000 so in the short term i worry that you know we could go a lot higher again compared to our population i will again say that you know a uh, number of deaths in spain were 500 times the number of deaths you know uh, per per million of population than we have right so if you look at by population we have done an absolutely stellar job people keep looking at absolutes but we are 1.4 billion people and i think uh, uh, that's no joke and honestly while a lot of our companies are struggling and we are unhappy about sort of the lives versus livelihood debate i would say that it was absolutely imperative to have the lockdown and in certain places the lockdown will continue i think the challenge of course is that while i think this was required and you will see in the next one or two months why it was required because the numbers will go up uh, the challenge is it's not doing well for our business we are a fragile economy 
and uh, you know in terms of businesses i'm sure a lot of you here have your own companies we are hurting uh, there is uh, i sit on boards of companies which used to do thriving businesses of 60 70 80 crores sometimes even 200 crores a month and they are down to close to zero right so it is a very very significant crisis there is also a big humanitarian crisis happening in the country because of the daily wage labor i heard on on a bcg call i think that 25% of all labor non agriculture in india is daily wage that is a massive massive problem as you can see the kind of issues happening the government has to grapple with all of this if we look at the intermediate stage let's say we are past our peak and you know slowly we have somehow controlled this virus and we the impact on it and slowly we are starting to open up i will call this intermediate stage intermediate stage is past the peak but no vaccine has yet been found right so keep in mind guys that everybody here that until you do not find a vaccine there is no real cure which we can see today right even the some of the cures we are seeing from japan or gilead or some of the other stuff it's it's not a cure it's a mitigant a little bit but it doesn't cure it does not necessarily save lives it improves it by 3 days you know the, the the symptoms get improved so there's some improvement but it's not a cure it's not like a headache you have a medicine it goes away no it becomes you know 10 20% better which could help but it's not a cure so until we find a cure right if we are really waiting for a vaccination because a lot of you are not going to venture out unless you absolutely have to because you are still going to be that worried about the uh, about the virus so the challenge is that actually i have a slightly different view on the intermediate period and it is slightly more negative than most people unfortunately and i want to be you know shooting very straight here because it's a very kind of you to spare an hour for me here to listen to me but i feel that from that time of july or whenever the peak comes until the virus has a vaccine right just play yourself out there think about um you are sitting sitting in 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 july august you know there is no vaccine there is no cure how much would you go out you might go out with a mask you might be very careful but there will be limitations you know continuous process industries businesses will go on other things will continue to happen you know you may have to if you have to work you will absolutely work but you will limit going to malls maybe you will limit traveling too much you will limit a lot of things and that part of the business is going to impact gdp and unfortunately i am not a believer that a virus a vaccine is around the corner the last vaccine which was developed took 5 years right there is many diseases where you know viruses where vaccines have never been found like hiv so i hope that we did, you know find a vaccine the viruses continue to morph we have an additional problem that 30 40 teams are making vaccines so we won't even know which vaccine works compared to the other and then we need to get into production of the vaccine which will take a long time for 7 billion people Right, because everybody pretty much needs to be vaccinated. So, sort of my unfortunate and uh, you know, and I certainly hope I'm wrong, is that by March to June of 21, we will get out of that phase which I call the intermediate phase, where things don't look as bad, but unfortunately, things don't look amazing either. Right, and and that phase I think is going to be unlike one we have seen before because, you know, it still has uncertainty. It's still not. completely like gdp is not going to be completely down but it's not going to be completely up either so i find that that phase could end up uh, being at least i have a slightly more um, you know difficult view of that and i think that is the phase which everybody here on this call and all of us have to survive right in terms of business uh, that is the phase where you know we lot of people even in our companies are thinking that by july august we'll be back and i sure hope we are back right and the consensus today is yes it'll be bad for two months but then we'll be back but if you apply yourself you can't completely be back till you get a vaccine and vaccines take time because you're going to administer them to billions of people they can't make mistakes so assuming we get a vaccine because after if we don't that's going to be a real tragedy so assuming we get a vaccine it's probably going to take at least 9 to 12 months from today and then what you're betting on is this intermediate phase where you know you will still be doing a lot of zoom calls you will go to work but you'll be very careful you know you'll be you know very thoughtful about everything that you're doing that phase where the animal spirits are not yet back right where it's still very very slow and tepid 
that phase going on for 9 to 12 months post that i think that once the virus vaccine is you know it shows up i actually feel that things are going to become much 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 better we will all like i started with look back and say that uh, oh there was this really bad period but we all surmounted it our business went through you know literally got you know excruciating problems but you know hopefully you have survived that problem and then you will look back and see that india will come back and even within that i think india will benefit in that period let's call it from march 21 july 21 india will benefit because everyone's not going to invest in every emerging country they're going to look for countries where there is a little bit more of safety security where there is trust and where there is size you know and uh, ability so even if you take uh, i think there could be some moves away from china as people balance their supply chains so i think india will be a pretty large beneficiary uh, you know in that period which i call the long term so i think the long term i firmly believe is very very good probably more positive than most people are uh, the short term i think all of us know that we have not reached peak and therefore the peak will happen and we will be shocked at some of the numbers uh, i think it is the intermediate period where i am a little bit more negative that i think most people have discounted that post peak people think things will be back to normal like china or <coughs> sweden whatever but i i fear that that period just because we are a huge democracy a lot of people and you've seen the queues on, on the wine shops for instance right there is that's a period where you could have a series of second lockdowns third lockdowns going up and down if we are not able to control ourselves between the time that uh, we have this peak so so between the time of peak let's say july and next march to july that period is the one which unfortunately i don't have good news for you guys um that said i mean this is sort of my view i think uh, the rest of it i actually feel the government gets that i think they have handled it quite well uh, i am also like a lot of you waiting for businesses to open but i have studied multiple countries and what they've done and no country other than china china i mean you know try had a very very diff- different way of disciplining their their citizens to make sure that it was violated and they were able to get over it right i think india is a thriving democracy and uh, to that extent i think that is the period to watch out for atul that's thanks thanks nidin so um uh i'll start with the questions that we have received um uh, first what is the advice that you would give to the founders under the current circumstances how do they go about now i mean there's so much fear among uh, all of them right so i think the biggest problem in this is the uncertainty right if you knew that okay you know the war happened this will take 6 months you know what to do what to plan right in you know we've always been sort of a country of planners right we always plan this will happen if this doesn't happen i'll do that if that doesn't happen i'll do this right we use a lot of jugad we plan it and we survive it i think the biggest challenge here is one day people wake up saying okay this will get over in few months one day people wake up and say you know nirin shah is saying that now this intermediate phase will last even nine more months what is going on right so i think the biggest thing is to sort of have your own view and candid view on where you think this you know where what you believe right i have a very strong belief in what i am saying and again the intermediate stage is not bad it's just that it's not back right it's still going to be little up and down and it could have multiple lockdowns what people are not thinking of is a second lockdown will come if we start hitting 10000 k new cases a day right they're not going to keep it open and the red zones are where the cities are unfortunately so you know when you have 25% of the lockdown is in 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 red zones but that is 50% of the gdp right so so that is the challenge so first and foremost is for the founders is a really good assessment of your business right you have to really look at your business through a different lens and and look at it and say that is this business something i want to do for the next 10 years because the next year is going to be terrible right is this a business which makes sense for me to do have i put in you know is there enough worth in that business should i continue this business should i change the business model take a very hard look at your business very carefully and try and understand 
sort of for this period for the next year how should you look at this business what are the changes you need to make the second thing you need to do is if possible you need to create and be more liquid and have cash right and and often times what happens is especially with successful businesses successful founders who have not seen this before they keep hoping we are all optimists i have been part of a founding team and the reason we have started businesses is that we are all optimists the reason i am a venture capitalist is this is this is you know i am an i am an optimist i believe in companies i believe in people i think they will do well but remember that your conditioning is optimism but this is a very different year right take those calls now which you need to take a very very good look at your business try and make sure that you know be little conservative say that for one year i will be bleeding maybe and what do i need to do right to to get get through this and raise cash liquidity is going to be critical because you don't know when the next lockdown will come you don't know whether there is a you know today all the big investment houses goldman morgan and others are all expecting a jan feb march surge next year again because like sars and like mers this is a winter disease which can come back right we don't know so some of the challenges are that you have to really look at like once you're in this phase you have to look at it very 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 hard look at yourself in the mirror and say this is a tough phase and i am not trying to thrive in it i am trying to survive if you are able to survive this intermediate phase short term you have to survive but intermediate phase if you are able to survive i think in the long run there will be less competition it is unfortunate but businesses are going to shut down right and i'm just trying to be very 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 humbly realistic over here so if you are not one of those you have been able to get through this crisis right you will be in a much better shape in the long term when things start getting a lot better so i would say that two basic things one is look at your business is this worth fighting for is this something which i know will work in the long run is this something i need to make some changes some pivots and then the second is on the cost side on the cash side stay liquid be prepared to survive the next year and be very clear with yourself a lot of businesses go up and down because we don't believe we feel like you know next month it will get better no no month after that it will get better how can it not get better china got better why are we not going to get better right i mean so and and trust me if we are wrong you will be in a better position you can you know unwind all the changes which you have made you can do whatever else you raise some cash fine you're not being greedy at this point of time what you're saying is i have cut cost i have done whatever it takes to get my business to survive so that i'm around in the long run when i need to and honestly i look at businesses in three ways i look at them as red yellow and green red is a business where you absolutely need money in 6 months yellow is a business where you absolutely need money in in 12 months and and green is a business where even up to 24 months you are looking quite liquid right if you are green today you are decent you are good right hopefully you will not be struggling on the second half of the 24 months if you are a red or a yellow you really got to start taking action now and uh, it's very unfortunate and sometimes you feel i have three more months of cash or four more months of cash but these if you're noticing yourself for the last two three months from march april now we are in may right this is uh, the virus is such a treacherous one that it is not easy to contain so i would say that survive through this 12 months of intermediate phase and then you know you will thrive so what would you niren tell the entrepreneurs who have not yet plunged into business right they have not launched their startup so do you think they should wait for a year in view of what you are just saying or they should uh, go ahead in a low key manner no i mean the you know uh, as they say never waste a good crisis uh, a crisis if you look at long term venture capital returns or company returns and we study that globally right businesses which have started in periods of adversity do very well they are built with a lot of toughness resilience they are built slowly it's like slowly cooking the khichdi right so start it off yes be little slow do not uh, spend too much uh, money right now uh, i would say that it is one of those things which you need to 
sort of you know build very carefully there are going to be new opportunities which come because of covid as long as you are thoughtfully building this in a slow and steady way you you should be in a good position again a year from now, now where things get a lot better so i would not tell anybody that stop but i would say that you know your chances of getting funding quickly easily you know as as easily as last year are are definitely much more difficult and so you have to build this business in a slightly different way probably be friends and family money it will probably be slower it will be less of people it will not be a big bang explosion where you say hey i've come today and i've built this business and next year i want to go out and get big funding and all that it will be thoughtfully built so i would say i would encourage people and you know when you build businesses in this time you're very very careful and those businesses do really well in the long run i have noticed myself that businesses built during adversity during periods of difficulty uh, just as a different mindset of the entrepreneurs which we really respect so niren uh, how do you see the global scene you worked in silicon valley for uh, so many years and uh, you are headquartered in the us so how do you compare us india as also india with other countries how are we placed Yeah. Are we yeah. well placed? Are we worse off? What is it? I think um, we have sort of amongst all the major countries in the world, right? We have been the last to get this COVID, right? And it is likely I'm not counting some of the African countries, no disrespect meant, but I'm saying the the large uh, the large com- countries, right? So if you look at that, we have been the last to get it because of lockdown. We have blunted the force. We have delayed. uh the impact of covid and so most people have gone through their peaks in march and we are or maybe they will go through in april but we are likely to go through our peak in june and uh and i hope i'm wrong and we this is already the peak but uh, this is my view so i think that we will actually get out of it later right because just by virtue of being a very large country we will get out of it later so we have something what i call the last mover advantage right we are able to see what different people are doing we are able to see the different strategies between china us south korea singapore the mistakes they have made why so many countries also have second lockdowns right so we will be able to benefit from that but we will come out of it a little later just because we started later right so i think that's one big difference other big difference is that in india you know because of where we are and because of where our per capita gdp is that not only is this going to be a, a a crisis of business and health but i also fear that this is going to be a humanitarian crisis and i think that we have to all be very cognizant of uh, of this issue because at some level there is going to be a large percentage of the population which is going to get more affected in terms of their lives if they do not get uh, if they are not able to go and earn their daily wage so i think to that extent our government will have some somewhat it's it's kind of between the devil and the deep blue sea the hands are tied and they have to open up the market a little bit because otherwise you know there is going to be a humanitarian crisis which may be even larger sometimes than the health crisis uh you know and uh, i'm talking about the daily wage workers i'm talking about people below the poverty line who need to work every, every day and are not as fortunate as all of us on this call uh to be able to have savings so now if you look at different different actions taken by people and i i will try and keep this short china basically used brutal sort of discipline and and was able to bring that in control within some 80 90 days uh and uh, i think if you look at singapore they thought they had it under control but they had a massive second lockdown you know when they thought they were completely clean there was a second lockdown that lockdown is still sort of hurting them and that came again from more the labor and the migrant workforces people who are living together uh, if you look at the us i think us has been up and down a little bit confused uh, i think they are starting to realize that business has to open up but if you look at new york the kind of you know 20 uh, i mean they get about 20 to 30000 new cases in the us every day it's quite significant and the number of deaths are quite significant right you look at some of the european countries spain italy so i would say each one has tried different things right check the public has been able to control it with masks south korea has controlled it with just very active contact you know they every single person you have contacted and china has been the same thing they are recording it 
on an app which is goes even deeper than arogya setu and they will go and hunt those people down and isolate them, right now again much harder in india to do that because we don't have those systems and processes government is trying very hard but much harder to do that so i feel that because we are so large and because we are so you know populated and a lot of people live together it is there are three four big problems right it's going to be harder to isolate it's going to be easier to you know be contagious and uh, and we will have to open up the economy and because of that like i said i think the intermediate stage will be a little longer <coughs> so in india at least i feel that we will have to be much more careful and you will find the government action going up and down and sometimes you may be bewildered as to why but i think some of it may actually be necessary you know, if the suddenly mumbai is going up a lot then mumbai will be in full lockdown and we won't have any you know we will have to sort of adhere to it but if it's not going you know if it's getting better then quickly we need to get people to go out there and employ some of the daily wage workers and let them work so you will see sort of you know this two sided you know uh, response right one side things are being pushed to open and the other side things are being sort of suddenly locked down because things went up and i think that's the dichotomy which we will need to live with and make sure our businesses are also sort of built in an adaptive and flexible way right so that we can go through this next one year of you know what i call the intermediate phase so uh, niren um, if you have to deploy your money today hmm. which sectors will you deploy in and just so that the participants have a clearer view what is the range of investments that uh, norwest uh, makes sure. in india right so i'll answer the second question first norwest will typically do series b onwards in venture capital so typically we would do about 10 million as starting ticket size and we can go all the way up to 50 million for more private equity companies uh i think we can do 7 8 million as an exception but we will not do seed and series a uh you know we typically will do more late stage we can do series b c etc uh i think uh, we do like 75 70% of our companies are actually profitable so we do like some semblance of profit but again obviously eventually we want to exit a lot of these companies to an ipo so we want to be able to see great teams and people who can take this you know the company should be having that market size or or, or having that market potential to go ipo and uh, you know we want to be able to take it to the public market in a horizon of 5 to 7 years uh, so that's sort of the thesis of where we play so we're more of growth equity and i would say late stage venture um in terms of spaces i'll tell you i have i have a interesting sort of i have a couple of themes right and 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 these themes could be quite interesting number one one of the themes i have is that of course there are i think i'm going to try and not say what you must have heard on different webinars too much because after a while it just becomes boring so yes there are some new opportunities things like edtech e health you know uh, uh, those kind of opportunities which will come a lot of digitalization where you know today we are having old people in all our families trying to learn a lot more of how to use the internet uh, and you know deliver some of this digitally i think those are all going to be massive forces if you look at the us amazon and i mean the the amount of e-commerce which happened in the last month is 75% higher than normal right most companies are at all time highs and digital is definitely getting a positive huge positive tailwind if this intermediate stage lasts for 12 months then people will still use digital so you know i think today people may not be ordering as much on the you know food order but in the intermediate phase people will order so deliveries groceries at home those kind of things will keep improving and uh, that will help having said that i want to say that one of my thesis is that in the long term which is maybe a year from now things will come back to you know where we are today i think everybody today feels like oh the world has completely changed and you know we will never go back yes we will make some changes there will be a 5% change more digital will happen but if you think you're not going to go to a party or a restaurant or not meet your friends you know once you know there is a vaccine inside of you and there is no chance you can get it right post that period i think that this current you know february or jan of india will come back with a bang so i am we are not writing of these businesses businesses like retail or logistics yes we do believe that um, you know there will be 
concerns in the short to medium term for some of these businesses but i am also playing a theme in my head of what i call mean reversion if you have done something for the last 30 years just because something went wrong for the last 8 9 months under very you know like i i i actually have this other view i think that a lot of people don't want to do zoom calls <laughs> you know after a while they are going to sit down and say look i've had enough of these calls i want to meet real people so so there will be a bit of reversion to the mean i would not write off all the other businesses but yes they will have to go through uh they will have to go through a tough time there will be a massive compression and they will have to survive this so one of my themes here is you know maybe at least for norwest again you know we are still you know, and then we'll come to that later but of course we are trying to analyze and understand the situation but at some point we may go and do more financial services which is offline or something in the retail space things we normally do and uh, on the other hand yes we could take some new areas like edtech you know e health uh, and and sort of increase some of our internet investing these are new areas areas where you know both my children today are continuously on different different types of edtech i must say that they love their school much more they don't like doing it online as much but but yes it is here to stay people are much more open to online tuitions uh things like that i would say that um that will happen i do believe that there is going to be another theme is i think there's going to be strong government support for msmes right please make sure that uh that you uh, you know on this call are well aligned your eyes are open when that then that comes you should be able to apply you should be able to pivot you should be able to get that money hopefully it will come i am a believer that this is such a big shock to the system that the government will have to do this and i am a believer that they will but uh, when it comes i would say uh, that's thing um, the other thing is i think uh, in this case urban ecosystem is more impacted than rural so people who have done rural again as the migrant labor goes back there is a question mark on whether they will take covid back with them to the rural areas and if that happens that would be again a travesty because there aren't the hospitals and ventilators in the rural areas as much but as of now it seems like a lot of the green areas like you know we have a great company in northeast and assam is you know doing very well it has 40 cases and you know the plant is on and it's a, it's a snack company called kishle and they're the largest guys in the northeast and they were running 24 hour shifts and they're hitting all time highs in terms of the production so if you are not in the urban areas you have access to rural areas those could do well the one watch out there of course is uh, that you know uh, do you have some of the so so these are some of the themes i would say um you know which i can think of i would also say that uh, you know there will be i mean it is like i i watched consumer behavior for 25 years right whatever i've done in my past has been related to consumer and i've noticed that you know when something like this happens it's a big catalyst it's a big trigger so you will move a little bit you know you will change a little bit earlier you're not going on video calls you will go maybe i used to travel two days a week for board meetings maybe i will travel one day a week maybe i will travel little less but it is very unlikely i will completely change my life you know unless this became a very prolonged crisis or something you know if it's one year you will come back and you will you know people will say restaurants will be down now yes there will be some you know challenges restaurants will face you know because of this one year period uh, but are we all on this call not going to go to restaurants if we knew that we can get nothing no they will they will find their way to survive and they will have to come back from there and i think that uh, you know i am actually very surprised with how everybody keeps saying the world has completely changed right i mean we are all sitting in a house because we're forced to right the minute somebody tells me i can go out i mean i don't want to sit in my house for a day if i can help it in the next uh, you know uh, once this happens so uh, so we should think of that very carefully and i think that is you know this contrarian theme is also one of the things we will look at so uh, since you mentioned um, so emphatically about um, edtech um, do you want to further elaborate on which specific sub verticals you like in edtech also is a question on overseas education uh, is there potential there uh niren sir uh, sorry to interrupt is it possible for you to wear your headphones yeah sure your okay. voice pitch keeps fluctuating at times so okay just give me one second sure
Okay, is this better? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay, very sorry, everyone. I wish you told me earlier. So your question, Atul, was on ed tech. I think in ed tech, if you look at um, spaces, and just tell me if I'm too loud as well, because this headset is very oh, powerful. No, perfect. Okay. So if if you uh, in ed tech, I think a lot of spaces, right? If you look at the entire K twelve space and you look at what's happening in China, there are many twenty billion dollar companies created in the after school market. And today we're the very nascent spaces. You know, we we've got companies like Baiju, but there are many other challengers coming up. So I would say the after school tuition market, uh, the the you know the whole taking sort of uh, government exams market, taking professional exams market. So wh- I think the question is, when you sort of come back from school, should you really be spending time going to a tuition teacher? Can you just do it online? There is also this whole lot of parents today want their children to learn coding. those markets are doing well there is this whole skilling market where you want to do something different you want to learn a skill you want to learn something else so there are companies uh, out there which are trying to say that okay you can learn you can change your profession midway by actually getting through uh, learning so there is a wealth of i mean i actually believe that you know i mean 20 years from now when my 10 year old uh, is is maybe you know uh, going through university or thinking of going overseas or whatever a lot of the education is going to be sort of at your own pace delivered in the palms of your hand through your phone right a lot of it is going to be gamified and so my view on this whole space is that this space is going to go through a major disruption regardless of covid right it is and i think covid has basically taught us that it can be done it has accelerated uh, accelerated the entire sort of pro- progress towards that but there is sort of offline education is going to transform your you will have school education in class education because it is good to have that social skilling where you're working with in a team with other students seeing their views but a lot of it can also be shorter school hours and come back home do your sort of you know interactive homework which is uh, so so i think there is a whole uh, wealth of areas moving towards this very immersive education like i don't know if you remember but i mean you know we, we you know you learn so much more if you just watch videos right you learn so much more if you as compared to just reading you know old textbooks at least when i grew up we had these textbooks when somebody on khan academy teaches you something it's so more so, so much more immersive so so i think education will kind of become like a three dimensional somebody out of a hologram can start teaching you and i think that there is a long way to go and a lot of innovation expected uh in the next 20 years and you know eventually we should not have to go into a classroom you go in because you expect certain benefits from it but uh, but you know there will be multiple people like it will be very standard to not uh, to say that look uh, how are you doing your education okay i am doing classroom education somebody else will say that look i am doing sort of you know online education and both will be equally well well accepted as university degrees and there was a question on sub vertical overseas education in ed tech yeah i think that there is a huge opportunity there i think that uh, you know there are companies already doing things in that space today where they've tied up with even top institutions like harvard and others and and you can sit here in india and actually get a course at harvard right with teachers teaching you and it being webcast so my sense is that there is a huge opportunity on overseas education uh in increasingly with you know this covid kind of thing there is next year a lot of universities overseas have actually said that they will do it online right they will not even ask you to fly down to canada or us and you have the choice to sit here and do your entire education uh even right now classes are going on and pe- different students are doing it overnight because it's us india so i think there's a massive opportunity on overseas education as well you talked about retail uh, industry Right. how do you compare brick and mortar versus uh, e-commerce especially since you said habits will not totally change i think see retail in the short term is having a significant impact it's going to degrow maybe 30 40% ac- according to mckinsey right so so this will have a huge impact i don't think people are going to visit malls uh, I, i i worry about that a lot of people have given force majeure notices uh in terms of uh, you know even their offline stores and there are 
even in the US, very big brands are going through liquidations because they're not able to support that sort of store business, you know, because this is just not expected, unanticipated. Uh, in the long run, I still feel obviously e-commerce has continued to proliferate, right? So if you look at Japan or you look at US, every single year e-commerce increases. But I think that if you look at um, in general, right, what will happen? I do think digital will increase maybe at a slightly faster pace because COVID has made us embrace digital, but retail will very much be there. Only thing there is that there the models need to be a lot more asset light. You know, for instance, I mean, again, if you take food models, you'll have to re reimagine. Maybe you have to do a couple of cuisines, not, you know, just one cuisine with a very large restaurant. Maybe it's a lot of delivery plus retail. If you look at uh, apparel stores, you will, you know, you will have to work a lot harder on your working capital. You know, uh, the working capital cycles can take very long. So you have to find... Uh, asset light ways uh, sort of, you know, to come back in retail and to be much more nimbler so that you can cater to the customer's taste when they come back. And again, I will keep saying this uh, so that I drill it into everybody. But uh, next year, you have to be very careful when you get opportunity to start your business, start it with full, you know, uh, at, at full speed. But then there could be further lockdowns, in which case you will have to sit tight as well. So make your business flexible to the extent it's possible, it's not easy. Um, but I don't think retail goes away. Retail is one of the largest industries globally, and I don't think it goes away. No chance. What do you have to say on fintech? So I think fintech, I mean, look, uh, uh, fintech is still a very small part of the Indian ecosystem. I think the challenge with fintech, that fintech is facing some pretty significant challenges today. And the challenge with fintech is a couple of things. Number one, Fintech relies on a lot of debt funding for themselves. It's not just equity. They need debt from the banks and others. That has been hard to come by. I think Fintech has also been easier to do in some of the spaces which are like personal loans, credit cards, unsecured loans. And those in these times, in times like this, this is a severe stress, right? It's more than the GFC. So in times like these, fintech companies are going through a lot of NPAs or, you know, bad loans because they don't have the security against it because they were lending to personal loans, you know, credit card loans. They were getting high rates, but, you know, so, so right now, at least what we are seeing is that the level of collection in fintech has been, uh, you know, some fintechs have done a great job. Again, I don't want to do this, but in general, if you look at the 300 fintechs that are in the country, they are actually having, you know, they're having significant issues on collection. And, uh, and again, it's going to be, you know, the boys, uh, you know, men versus boys in this space. I do not unfortunately believe that every fintech is going to survive this time. Uh, but the ones which survive, which, which will have a great, again, they will, they will benefit from the whole digital wave. And at that point of time, you know, they will, become stronger and stronger if they've survived this. But again, I want to say that I don't, I unfortunately believe that then there will be a fair number of fintechs which may not survive unless the government comes in. Uh, we have also been writing to the government saying that uh, it is an important part to help the sector as well. But we will see what happens, government and RBI. What about communication vertical? So look, communication is going to do really well, right? If you look at telecom, I mean, that is the least affected business, right? I mean, Jio and, you know, Bharti Airtel and just generally communication is going to be a big beneficiary. We are communicating more and more, whether it's even from things like data or it's voice. I think that that sector is the least affected today. Uh, I think uh, the number of players in that space, if you take things like Jio and Airtel and things like that, um, I would say that... Uh, the the entire space is is consolidated quite well. They have gone through their own problems in the past, but right now it looks much better outside of this license fee issue, which a couple of companies are going through. Um, so I think that that space, the communication space, is uh, you know well set. We are communicating more and more. We're not doing it one on one in person, but we're using different media to communicate. So media communication, those spaces, I can kind of feel that they will continue to do well. There, the question will just be, you know, if you're building an app or a company around that, what is your sort of uh, differentiation? How do you ensure that you are not com competing against, uh, you know, very large guys? 
you know, and uh, how do you differentiate, right? Is there any innovation? What about digital marketing and virtual reality? So again, I think if you look at AR, VR, uh, and, uh, you know, I think that's a big space. I think that space is already proliferating in the US. I think it will come to India as well. Uh, again, uh, monetization in that space is something which needs to be looked at. I think if you look at uh, digital marketing right now, not too many people are marketing. So again, it's not a boom time. Uh, but again, I think that uh, number of players in digital marketing space will reduce. Uh, if you're an intermediary or something like that. And then eventually, obviously people like Facebook and Google are doing quite well at this point of time because you're only getting eyeballs from the web, not in real life. But uh, but the intermediaries, not too many, a lot of people have cut their digital marketing budget. So that's going negative right now. In the long run, again, same thing. I feel that there will be some consolidation in this space. Uh, there, there, there were a lot of digital marketing agencies. Some are executing better than others, and those. This is going to be an execution game. Like you talked of uh, reducing costs, yeah, and be in readiness for uh, more frequent lockdowns and a year of pain. What is your advice? How do we all startups? Uh, cut costs. Are there any ideas you would give? Sure, sure. And I saw a lot of questions on that. So look, firstly, I would say that uh, this is a big crisis, even on a humanitarian basis. So while we sit on boards, you know, our belief is you have to be very humane about this. And to the extent possible, uh, you know, it is, it is, I think you start at the beginning, at least it starts by leading from example. We've seen most of our best companies saying that, look, if they want to cut costs, they want to cut salaries, <laughs> it starts at the top. It's very hard for the founder not to do it. The second thing is, can we make this up in some ways? Can we give options instead? So a very, uh, you know, uh, I would say an adaptive, flexible way of doing this. In many companies we have seen are not cutting people. They are cutting cost, like they are cutting salary. So what they will do is they say that, look, till this crisis is going on, you know, everybody's taking a 25, 30% haircut, right? And the more junior people take less haircut, the more senior people take a higher haircut. And, and again, not easy, but maybe somewhere the senior people maybe get some options. So do the junior, but pro rata, whatever it is, that is one way. The other thing is you saw this big note from Airbnb. They tried that at some point they realized that at least for the travel sector, for instance, this is like a 75% of the business is going away. It's very, very, very hard. So at that point, they had no choice but to start cutting, you know, their, their overheads. And it's not just obviously people, but it's also, you know, office spaces. It's, uh, you know, any stores, it's any, you know, travel stores, etc. It's, uh, you know, operating overhead. So you have to be very thoughtful. I think knee jerk reactions don't work. You have to really think about how to do this. You have to be very, I personally find it's much easier to explain to people and what we try to do is we've sort of put down plan ABC in a lot of places saying that, look, if we are starting to hit these numbers, this is what some of these companies are going to be able to support. But if we are not able to hit even this number, right, then they will, you know, very openly we're telling people that, look, there will be some salary cuts maybe, uh, you know, if you have two floors of office premises, we have brought it down to one floor for some of our companies. So there are a lot of like, so if you look at your entire cost side, Firstly, you can cut down, you know, adjacent businesses, you know, things you are trying to get into. You can cut down experimental stuff. You can cut down things you are trying to build for the future. Uh, then you come down to the core. Within the core, you have to figure out where you will not be sort of making investments. What are the key people? And it's a very, it's, it's hard in a country like India because you have to be very humane. And, and again, if you plan well in advance, you can let people know they can, you know, it, it's better to do this through like a town hall, keeping everybody involved. I think the other thing which, which uh, I mean, while it's very unfortunate, you don't want to do series of cuts. Every month you cannot go back and say, cut this more, cut this more. So you have to be very thoughtful about where you stand. 
and at that point of time whenever you decide to do either a salary cut or you decide to even reduce headcount if you have to firstly you got to show your employees that you've tried everything else i think it's very very important to be able to provide that comfort you should be leading from example but when you come down you need to come to a particular number communicate a lot with the employees and as a last resort if you do cut the employees also it is be very very humane in cutting that cost a uh, very you know communicative and then if things get better uh, it would also be great to be allowing them to come back first because it's not going to be easy to get jobs in this market so this is not like a normal market it is going to be a difficult market so uh, so i mean it's not uh, it's not an easy decision okay so uh, thanks this was um, this was very useful uh, what you explained now some more verticals industrial prop tech business so i'll tell you when you mean prop prop tech i assume property right so i would say that real estate and property is unfortunately going to be one of the uh, most affected businesses even more than retail uh, the reason for that is that i mean it is the most in some ways discretionary expense buying a house um i think the other thing is that you do require to go and visit inspect things like that it is a high ticket purchase and obviously uh, even if you're looking at it from the real estate developer side they have a lot of loans a lot of projects are remaining unfinished so you will generally find headwinds in that space all across and it will be a very hard space uh to i'm i'm not about the rental space as much in the prop tech because that would still do well but but in the whole property development as well as you know ownership i think it's going to be a difficult space when you cut your costs and i think a lot of people one of the learnings by the way from china is 70 80% of china is back up but a lot of the consumers are feeling the pinch and they're feeling the you know they they're feeling the pinch of uh, sort of losing their jobs and they're feeling the pinch of uh, cost which they incurred during the crisis so even that you don't if you don't feel like you have a lot of money if uh, banks and nbfcs are not loaning money to you it's harder to do real estate so i think unfortunately real estate may be one of the last guys to recover uh, in this space uh, together with travel and you know airlines and uh, that is just the reality of the situation i mean even we heard that deepak parekh himself said that you know uh, real estate prices may correct 20% uh at least that's what i had read in the research report i had not heard him directly but but um, but i think that there is a longer correction there because when people are hurting which people are doing the first thing they do is they put off you know something which is a capital decision a big loan an emi decision uh they just put it off for a couple of years so that may take even longer um and again you should really relook at that business very carefully to understand how you want to play that space what about eco friendly products uh, of daily use uh, do you think there'll be a consumer shift towards uh, environmental friendly products i think there will be right in the sense that we have all learned through this process that you know whether it's the birds or the animals i mean we have sort of at least i've got i've read a lot of stuff where you know we are doing a lot of damage to the environment and this this whole time we have caught up we, we i personally feel that we have stopped a little bit as a human race and looked at ourselves and our footprint we are creating having said that i see the impact or the sort of i would say the tailwind to be like a little bit more not too much more because i feel mean reversion always happens people tend to forget they will remember that listen you know some of this is our own karma you know you got all these whatsapps going around saying that you know now the the air is cleaner the you know animals are coming back out you know uh, birds are chirping etc so everyone remembers it today i think we would be at least lot more environmentally conscious uh, but i worry that consumer behavior is such that there will be a little more of a mean reversion but yes there will be a tailwind it's not going to be very binary it's not like tomorrow morning things will completely change but there will be uh, a tailwind what about precious jewelry in e-commerce sector and also beauty products in e-commerce so i think looking at china beauty products the bpc space as it's called you know uh, beauty products uh, consumer space that has come back quite quickly because people still you know we have a hair color space in in the us 
uh, which only sells hair color online that has grown 12x during this time people want to look in the mirror and <laughs> color you know they you know they're spending so much time with themselves they want to look decent they want to look good uh, so it's it's quite interesting that the beauty product space has been one of the fastest to come back and uh, i would say though precious jewelry is little bit different again it's a little bit like buying precious jewelry car house they are major capital expenses and uh, you know depending on the ticket size or whatever those will take a little bit longer uh, i think gold is doing very well because people look at a gold as a safety net a lot of people are saying that look if you know uh, the world doesn't do well gold will do well so there has been investment in gold but i i won't put precious jewelry and gold in the same category um, precious jewelry in general i mean a lot of marriages are getting cancelled a lot you know getting pushed back rather or they going to get it get done not in a you know you know not 500 people in the room kind of marriages they going to get done with 15 marriages so all of these things are having some impact on the jewelry sector uh, i think you know things like other vertical e-commerce uh, segments you know we're seeing that uh, food delivery while it's taken an impact it's starting to come back in a big way globally food delivery has been at about 80 90% where investors in swiggy i sit on the board just just uh, sort of uh, 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 saying that we are starting to see the numbers come back grocery delivery is doing very well uh, we are seeing that as well uh, i sit on the pepper fry board we are starting to see that uh, furniture interestingly globally wayfair is now you know 3x the market cap it used to be uh, a few months ago so again in furniture people are not going to get a carpenter to come into their house and uh, build furniture so tomorrow if you've been sitting on a bed and it's giving you a bad back ache or you need a mattress uh, unfortunately for you it's just easier to sell the whole ready made dream so again guys like pepper fry they're seeing some pretty significant uh, growth in in their businesses so i would say vertical e-commerce i mean i'm not an investor in lens card but i understand that again after a while people are buying online uh because they don't want to go into that shop right now so we are seeing a lot of tailwinds in verticalized players uh which are more utility right which are more needed uh not i mean essential is obviously doing well i don't want to keep repeating that but even in non essential e-commerce uh people are are doing quite well what about uh, slightly deviating from uh, verticals uh, what about the commercial uh, properties that uh, that is office space that many of our startups have taken on rent and uh, in the current situation everyone wants to cut cost how have you seen your investee companies how successful they are in renegotiating rent what is the advice they have from lawyers about the force major uh, clause and uh, what is the way how do because like some owners may resist they say no we don't want to reduce right. uh, force right. major clause also lawyers are giving opinion both ways how right. does one handle this uh, for a startup it's a really good question i think we have been grappling with this across i think most companies which have a big large retail footprint have had and triggered the force major notice part of it is dependent on how you written your agreements but a lot of our uh, agreements or a lot of our companies agreements were written with you know something like a lockdown certainly triggers a force major so uh, a lot of them had to give notice very early on they had no choice because of the kind of costs and burn they were running so those uh, then what has happened is there is a significant negotiation with the landlord because again remember the day the lockdown opens malls will not open you know real estate may not open because people will still take time to come into your shop they are not going to jump and say oh i will go shopping they are still worried right intermediate phase so so the problem is that there also there has been a lot of negotiation with uh, landlords uh, in a in a very proactive way saying that look either move to a revenue share or move to a minimum sort of rental plus a revenue share and they've been quite open um, there have been landlords who have not agreed where we have just had to terminate the contract in line with the agreements and move on because after a while i mean some of these things uh, people people don't seem to sort of and there is no other way to do it because the kind of cost you incur is just so high that the company will not survive if you don't do that so in a lot of cases i would say that there is very strong renegotiation happening and therefore the real estate sector is also bearing the brunt of that um i think that a lot of that is happening on the commercial side i don't think it's individual as much 
uh, and people are open because what they're saying and realize that getting somebody today is going to be very difficult so maybe for the next one year they come over and then after that it will normalize or i will take some upside so one of our companies is sharing some upside with the landlord so we realize that if we do very well a year up down the line we should pay them why not because you know if they have come in our help at the at, at time of our need why should we not pay them when when we are doing slightly better on a variable basis so this is calling this is what i mean by variableization of your model right that whether it is you know people also like if you are taking a salary cut if you start doing better give them a bonus give some of it back you know so you can sort of go up and down you can survive today but when you do better don't forget them so at uh, one end you are saying next one year there will be lot of pain yes but the stock markets are going up and up yeah uh, i saw that question yeah yeah like you see so, us us is uh, <laughs> markets are down just uh, 10% Correct. from the peak uh, pre covid 19 yeah and same thing in india they are higher by at least uh, uh, 20% compared to the bottom that we had seen uh, in march yeah so how yeah. do you see these valuations uh, in the stock market and how would they compare with uh, startup valuations oh so um, here's my view i think the stock market is not not yet accept the reality of where the covid is going they are not agreeing with what i had to say earlier today uh they basically expect a v shaped type recovery looking at the valuations uh the us stock market is being driven completely by this big bailout if you look at the global globally what happened during the gfc the us basically just spent its way out of it i don't think it made any big difference on the core gdp but the debt to gdp increased dramatically and it worked right and so they're trying to do the same thing out of this but at some point if you just keep printing money right even if you are the default currency of the world at some point somebody some people are going to call you on it and it is risky so i think globally financials of globals uh, of countries are not that great because people are just resorting to printing money and they're coming up with a 2 trillion 5 trillion package again the challenge is that uh, we don't uh, you know us does not go through any downgrades of course uh you know because it's the sort of default currency uh, things like that but if we were to do the same uh i would worry that uh, we would go through downgrades so again how big a package india will get is a question which everybody keeps asking uh in india i think people are anticipating some package uh i think part of the market is because of that but i think people are also have not yet seen the extent of damage to the results uh as these results start coming out i would be surprised if the markets hold at these levels but again i'm not a market person so don't take my advice for it um i think that again you know if things come out faster if we do not hit new peaks this is the highest of course the market deserves to be where it is but if we expect a slightly more prolonged problem at least certain industries the market is overpricing certain industries they have gone down quite a bit like if you look at financials i mean they have got corrected quite quite uh, dramatically now if you look at the public markets versus the private markets i think the private markets unlisted companies take a long time to reach the public market valuation so so while the public market still may be hopeful i think the private markets are still you know still in the shock period and i think unfortunately valuations will adjust uh you know in line with some of the public markets over the course of the next 6 months but that is typically happened i have seen four crises so far and private markets are always slow to react if they have money they don't go out they try and wait for it but we are already seeing companies come to us saying that look this deal didn't happen could you do the deal at 50% low right and it's it's it started now and i think uh, unfortunately it's a sign of the times so so um it is it is it will take a little longer but unfortunately valuations are going to correct and one of my other pieces of advice for everybody would be that if you really need money don't keep holding out because if this takes longer the money will get more and more difficult to get uh it is better to sort of you know what i say live to fight another day rather than if you are down to that kind of thing and raise that money don't worry too much about valuation you know survive this period and then post that thrive oh that's um, very very good uh, advice that you uh, given uh, 
what about food products particularly in uh, post covid scenario uh, the people have become very particular about uh, healthy foods ayurvedic foods so do you see more potential do you see some innovation in this food space yeah uh, food is a is a space we are looking at as well uh, and i think that uh, health food and uh, yeah i think organic you know uh, from, from the farm you know entire farm to fork those are going to be very important uh, spaces uh, i think going forward um, it does need to have a good distribution it does need to have some scale uh but i would say that uh, that continues to be a big i mean people are looking at their health right i've seen a lot of people in the beginning of this covid crisis very interesting a lot of people were you know saying that i put on weight but as this crisis has sort of elongated i'm seeing this you know a lot of people around me are getting much fitter they are doing something with their exercise routine they're using their time well so i think that health is going to be a very major thing whether it's food or whether it's nutrition or you know different uh, aspects of it organic organic you mentioned what about ayurvedic products yes i think ayurvedic alternative medicine like today even today one of the things rajiv bajaj has been saying on cnbc and i believe it is that homeopathy has good cures to respiratory ailments you know and so there are i mean there are people there are countries which have used homeopathy like germany quite <coughs> extensively uh, uh for for issues like this so i think that alternative medicines like ayurveda and homeopathy uh there will be a lot more especially when allopathy has no responses like in covid there is another talk that post uh, uh covid in the sense uh, post the intermediate stage would countries move towards more socialistic policies is this an end of capitalism in the world i don't think so actually so i think what will happen is that uh, once this is done i i do feel that countries like india have to be a little more socialistic and humanitarian because of you know the divide but i don't really see countries like the us and europe moving away you know i mean it is definitely caused people to sit back and think but i am a big believer that you know until something much more dramatic happens it's not going to change and and i think mean reversion does happen and uh, they can you know everyone is continuing to defend their own form of responses which is based on their ideology and their form of governance so so if you look at sweden it's very laissez faire they have kept it open they've not shut everything down they defend it compared to denmark which has shut a lot of things down so each one's ideology is it's very hard to move unless you can really prove concretely uh, i don't think ideologies will change do you think there will be more use of uh, virtual reality in advertisements uh i think that the ad space is getting reorganized in a lot of ways so i mean whether it is you know virtual reality vr has to be a lot more prolific across i think it's just coming to india vr and ar like i mentioned earlier uh but yes i think the advertising space will change there will have to be more engaging ways to advertise uh i think the current sort of advertising form especially as more of us go digital uh there will be more and more sort of unique ways to advertise so i do believe that uh, that advertising that the space is ripe for some disruption so here is a question i'm yet to launch my infant baby food business what should be the growth strategy in the given scenario so i would say that uh, you know work uh, work on a one to many model go to some of the blog sites which you know this baby chakras and others uh, where where you can try and get a certain level of your core users you know prototype your business make sure that you have got sort of what i'll call beta testers don't try and yet go into full launch mode in this market 
right? Try and because you will need to establish some trust. You will need to understand that this works, this doesn't work and use this time to perfect your product market fit. And once you're perfected that and post this crisis being over, go out and raise some angel money and then try and distribute this to a wider audience. But perfected using Amazon and, you know, Flipkart and all these things perfected at a low cost basis. I don't know if that helped. Yes, we, we covered a lot on B2C space. Do you want to touch upon B2C sure, space? Sure. Yes, yes. SaaS models. Yeah, yeah. Well, SaaS is a space we've invested quite heavily in. We actually had an exit of six SaaS companies. So I think SaaS is, uh, it all depends on the type of SaaS you're doing. Like if you're doing SaaS to the retail market or the travel market, you will have some impact. But in general, SaaS to the enterprise space, I think that is, uh, that will do quite well. And I, I continue to believe that uh, there is a lot of potential in that uh, in, in SaaS businesses. Uh, initially, we, you know, I did another webinar on the SaaS space. And I'm just saying that initially there is going to be some pushback on getting new, uh, you know, uh, new clients to sign up. It will be sort of much more of cross sell and upsell with your current set of clients uh, and customers. But uh, in the long run, the enterprise B2B space continues to do well. Uh, you know, I think SaaS will continue to do well as digital prolif proliferates. So, uh, but obviously end use industry, right? If it's, if it's retail, if it's, you know, if it's travel, if it's real estate, those clients are going to hurt. They're not going to do that much. But in certain cases, we have seen that places like logistics, we've seen companies where there were a lot of clients on the fence. And when this happened and clients had to actually deal with uh, logistics from their homes, they actually went out and digitized it and moved on to the SaaS platform during the COVID crisis. So, you know, some of the SaaS sort of, uh, as, as this proliferates a little bit, I feel that SaaS will actually do quite well. What do you have to say for content business, content for TV and uh, film, uh, TV and film, the entertainment industry, currently they can't even shoot, but how do you see the future going forward? Look, I think that it's getting more polarized, but if you are a great content provider, I mean, earlier, you know, we used to have a norm 10 years ago that people never invested in content from the VC industry. That's gone away, right? So today, if you have great content, people like, you know, uh, Netflix, Hotstar, Amazon Prime will, you know, basically, you know, I mean, give you top dollar for that. So I think that there is a lot of opportunities now, but again, it is not like, I mean, they're not going to be like 20,000 studios doing it. I think you have to be, you have to be really good at your trade to, to be able to build a very vibrant business in, in content. And again, there is all kinds of content businesses. So whether it's news content, it's natural, it's, you know, vernacular uh, language content. So I think again, content platforms, if you have them and you're distributing, that is also going to be a very interesting business. We've seen those businesses really take off in China. What about IT, ITS business? So look, we've invested in those and we continue to believe that they will be quite robust. I mean, they may have one year of a little bit of a shock, but they will continue to do well. I think um, like the TCS gentleman mentioned that one more area where they may save cost is they may allow their, their people to work from home. And increasingly, he mentioned that why, you know, why nearshore and why offshore? I mean, we might just, you know, cut cost even further by 20 you know, 30% people largely working from home, we may not need that real estate. So, so I think the IT models will also, and Atul, actually, you are probably better, you know, than I am in answering this question, actually. But, uh, but, uh, but I do feel that models will keep innovating. And every time you test the model, or test something because of a crisis like this, never waste a good crisis, as I said earlier, uh, you will find that certain tweaks will happen to the model. And one of the weeks we are learning is that, you know, you can be incredibly efficient in your house and uh, working from there as well. I don't think it's good all the time, but I do think that, uh, you know, I will be far more open uh, to doing that going forward than I used to be. What about extracurricular activities for kids uh, through online? Well, all of us parents sitting at home <laughs> have understood that it is an absolute crying need. Uh, that said, there are a lot of people who provide that. So you have to have a very strong business model to make sure that there is a platform there, right? Eventually, uh, like the after school ed tech market, the after school extracurricular market is a pretty big space. 
but you have to find a way because it's such a local business you know you have to understand the quality of the you know each of those providers rating system etc so i mean it has to be built very carefully over a long period of time uh, and i think it could be interesting i think we've covered really uh, quite uh, extensively otherwise we can just i think go. some people asked about retail i think we had talked about retail sector yeah, earlier yes uh, yes but i'll i'll just say that look i think that uh, you know again i do not see that i i see that there will be pain in retail but i do not see that there will be pain i mean we we are as an you know human beings are animals who need to go outside right they need to meet other people that is not going to go away we will need to go to restaurants we will need to go to malls and yes this is going to be a crisis like no other but it's not going to go away and i think today what's happened is we've seen so many webinars saying that the world is completely changed that we are living in an alternate reality and we are forgetting that there is a proper reality somewhere else right so i am still of the view that retail will come back but yes survival will be damn tough really really tough in the next year because imagine you have a store you have all the costs and nobody is coming to your store for so many months or you start the store and again there's a lockdown and you have to shut it down so this will be a heart wrenching period but one way if you are able to push through uh the other question i saw was on financial services i think financial services we talked about fintech but the services space again a lot of the companies are now able to collect so i actually feel that they will have npas there will be a period i think because the end customers hurting uh, npas will be there but again there will be a mean reversion financial services is one of the fastest area uh, growing areas of the economy so eventually banking finance companies will continue to thrive again 6 months maybe a little bit slower they will have to collect all their loans i think one of the challenges is new loans are not getting disbursed today because every single person is focused on collection and to that extent i think one of the challenges in our economy is that debt is not available when you probably most need it so that challenge will also happen so i would say that uh, you know 6 months of some pain but uh, you know uh, that's what it is i think on co working spaces i think there are there are there's there's one question i just saw atul uh, um, the 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 entire co working space has both a positive and a negative the negative is that people are going to be obviously in the short term potentially walking out of these co working spaces and working from home but in the long run people are also seeing this as saying hey i might work only 3 days a week uh, and you know 2 days i might work from home right so as you see this gig economy etc you might see that that entire potential of co-working could just really open up uh, you don't necessarily need an office you may decide to just use a co-working space you know people have just become much more open to 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 shifting uh, their space in terms of their workspace and that is just opens up the mind to co-working what about online insurance space i think online insurance has been one of the biggest beneficiaries in china today when people have come back you know uh, the the whole china is 80% up and running everything is on and you know while consumers are hurting the level of online insurance they have bought is much higher one of the key takeaways when you sit back you know maybe you know 6 6 months later you'll say that ah better to get insured you never know health insurance you know stuff like that people have just it's gone up step jump so one of the biggest beneficiaries in china as the dust settles has been online insurance there is a repeated, very bullish and looking at that space as well okay yeah, there is a repeated question on opportunity for mobility as a service okay for fnb and retail so i think there are a lot of players already there doing food delivery right i mean uh, so when you say mobility i'm assuming uh, people going and delivering whether it's on uh, it's basically food delivery right so i think that that service continues to be there but there are some very large players and of course i'm interested in one but but i would say that um, uh, so all these guys you know whether it's dunzo or it's swiggy genie now they you can take stuff from a retail mall and you can get it delivered to your house already so yes if you're doing something unique and differentiated by all means but if it's the same service i would always ask that look there is you know different different players doing some of these things already 
a lot of the food delivery guys are now doing grocery they're doing you know concierge services so they become effectively delivery players right and and uh, why i mean today if you want to pick up something they can do it for you so so you have to figure out what you are doing differently and find a niche where you can do it much better than someone else and from there maybe i think are, uh, listen i want to just say that there are a lot of questions and i feel like you know we haven't uh, answered so many questions and i would have really loved to sort of uh, you know keep answering uh, uh, you know on this but i just want to also acknowledge that they are just flashing by my screen uh, and uh, there are a lot of them and in case we haven't answered your questions i mean i humbly apologize uh, but i think you sort of signed it and i'm happy to take a few more questions or i have no problem depending okay, on how much so time we there have is, there is one question though you have addressed uh, in some way again these are repeated question on healthcare industry yeah so let me go into details right i think that healthcare e pharma is going to grow like 3 to 5x in the next uh, year year and a half right it has become very legitimate you know people are ordering medicines at home i think it's had its magic moment and frankly for me i mean i found that for my dad when i order medicines i had never ordered medicines you know uploading prescription and all that was very hard and we have no investments in the space so once i've done it i realized that it is for the chronic medicines right where it's you know you have to keep repeating these medicines on diabetes blood pressure whatever that has become so easy so i think that there is this thing where a lot of people they are going to continue to retain all this covid uh, people i think there are also a lot of these offline chains which are doing very well and they are also allowing to the question early on delivery they are doing home delivery so they will also continue to do well i think the telemedicine space will do extremely well i think that is going going to grow like 8 10x in the next few years um and that you know i think there was a report also by uh, red seer and and they said that you know that and they sort of seem to agree that that is also going to be a big evolution in tele medicine so i think that lot of the spaces related to you know healthcare is one area which has been least impacted in this whole covid crisis and i think it's also given everybody a pause to think whether it's us which is saying that i don't want to have all my apis coming from china or whether it is you know even us in india uh everyone has realized the importance of healthcare and and you know what needs to be done so i continue to believe that whether it's private equity investing in proper pharmaceutical companies uh you know or api manufacturers that business will continue to remain robust okay there is a specific question uh here is a company uh which is us company with de- development center in india i guess it must be it it space uh, where should the company go for funding in us or india so according to me it all depends on where your headquarters are and where your market is right so there are a lot of companies come to us they are in the us they got a dev dev center in india and pune or something i would them that look if you board member your sister should normally be in the place where the you know the headquarters are where the main team is right and where you actually have your most of your customers right because they will have a better understanding of the product market fit so they should so depending i didn't really understand where these are but the answer is short answer is wherever your sort of you know your core market and your sort of you know main team is management team is that's where you should go and get get uh, and and typically like a lot of companies come to us we are both us and <coughs> india and this is how we sort of uh, thread the needle Niran how do you make investment decisions like you get so many proposals and you only select a few right what do you what are the key factors that influence your decision right so i am a firm believer because you know before i did this i was an entrepreneur right and we started bazi i am a firm believer that venture capital private equity is not necessarily for everyone everyone gets very excited about it but you don't really have to you don't need it it's like a booster you know it's giving you a boost it's giving you something that if you want to be on a high growth high trajectory path this is a booster which you can get and obviously they take a stake in return and then they expect an exit right so we've seen in the us so many amazing businesses have got built with not a single paisa from vcs or pe so firstly there's nothing wrong with that and i am not going to push that you have to take it or whatever now 
what the VCs and PEs, they are willing to put in money with a reason. They have an ulterior motive, right? Their motive is that we will grow this company quickly. We will make this company profitable quickly. And then we will go take it to an IPO or we will exit it through an MA. Right. So again, what people and uh, people normally look at is a couple of things. One is, does that founder have the capability, that vision, that ambition to be able to do that? Do they have the domain expertise? Do they have the management team? Can they attract amazing people to their company? Right. Then on the market, is this market big enough? Right. If this market is very tiny, how will we produce or how will we build a big company together? Right. So what is the kind of business model they're op operating on? Is it always going to remain free? Is it something which is very sort of too much in the future, too much in the past? Is it very competitive? So uh, kind of market structure, right? Is this going to be like today, EdTech is very hot, but there are 50 companies in EdTech, right? So this is where some of the EdTech companies are very hard to fund because there are too many me too companies and and it's hard to decide that which one of these is going to become the big player in the, in the space. So, so what is the market structure? What is the market dynamic, right? Then we look at, uh, of course, things like competition. And then we look at overall, what is the margin, right? In case, uh, uh, you know, if if you look at about uh, the, the margin sort of on uh, uh, eventually, what will you get, right? So furniture has a good margin, food has a good margin. So at least for us, we look at the margin because eventually you have to be profitable, right? And, and it is not something where, you know, again, low margin business is sometimes hard to sort of produce big companies. So these are just a couple of factors which people look at. It has to be a scalable business. It has to be sustainable. It should have some entry barriers, things like that. So um, I saw an interesting question about some 30% of the companies uh, uh, failing or something. Uh, actually, we've had a, we, we've not, we've not had 30% failure. We've had actually, uh, we have been fortunate to have uh, a much lower failure rate. And the reason is partly because we also invest in profitable companies and we invest in growth equity. And obviously those are much later stage. So we have been quite fortunate to, to I mean, we've had about 25 exits already, but that doesn't mean the others are not alive and kicking. They're doing quite well. I think we've had failures. Uh, failures have been about three or four companies which have not done well. That's part of the venture piece. And I think part of the areas of failure to put your question Atul, in a very different way is that um, sometimes we have sort of realized that the entrepreneur is only looking at uh, sort of you know they have not built out a great team they have been very short-sighted they have not built it towards a vision in one other case we found that the business model um, was not able to like as soon as you started scaling the pricing had to keep reducing and there was no margin in the business and it was very hard to scale that business you could charge. So, so those, um, in another business, I would say that uh, the competition was way too intense and our competitors did a much, much better job of uh, raising funds than we were able to do. So, I mean, some of these businesses, you know, in India, they do get too competitive and you know, those are some of the problems which, which we have faced. So Niren, you talked of margin. Uh, what, sort of cutoff margin you would look at for gross margin or EBITDA or whatever you're looking at? So look, we don't, I mean, typical, look, so there are two, three things. If you want to get a little bit more technical, I think we look at both return on equity and margins. So sometimes there can be a business like a milk business, for instance, right, may not have great pat margins. It may be a two, 3% margin business, but its return on equity can be 40%, right? So we look at both of them. So I don't want to make this into a gen generalization, but typically we want to look at gross margins in the range of like, you know, I would say 30 plus percent, right? Even our food delivery businesses, uh, all our other businesses, they would have 30 plus percent because you want to at least end up at a 10% type, you know, 10 or 15% EBITDA margin so that your sort of PAT margin, uh, in fact, I would say 20% EBITDA margin so that your PAT margin is, is, uh, is at least at about, you know, 10%. So, so I, 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 and I would say that this is not a hard and fast rule because also a lot of times when you come early, the margin structures are going to change in the industry. So sometimes you don't start with a high margin, but you believe that because of scale, look at the e-pharmacy players where we have no interest, but because of scale, they're slowly, slowly improving their margin, right? Or you look at the sort of of taxi web aggregators, they start off at a very high negative margin, but in the long run, 
they had shown in some other place that they could get to about 20-30% margin and, and, and that, that could be very interesting. Can you give an example of some successful exit that you had, uh, how you went about, why do you call it successful? Of, of course, multiplier uh, of your capital invested is, is the success. Right, right. Yeah, it's a good question. So, I mean, look, we've had a partial exit in uh, Swiggy where we made 15 times our money. We came in very early stage. Came in when the company was a fledgling. It was number four. Uh, you know, there used to be Zomato, of course, but there was also Food Panda and Tiny Owl and some of the other guys. We really liked the team. We were very, very excited about the space. We thought that food delivery was just, why wasn't it happening? And uh, we went to every company which was larger than it. And then we found that this was the company where we liked the team the best. We came in very early stage and uh, we did a little bit of secondary uh, in the last uh, two, two, two rounds ago. And we made a good return on that. And it was uh, decent sized. Uh, the other exit, uh, I mean, we've done about 20 exits. So I can tell you that we took, uh, uh, you know, we've taken a, a couple of banks. We've taken a company called Thyrocare in the health space. Uh, we did a private equity transaction. We took it IPO. It did very well for us. We have one in the logistics space called Snowman. Similar, we took it IPO. Uh, we took RBL Bank public. We were the first investor in RBL Bank. Uh, it was a very good exit. I mean, the stock price has come down now, but uh, it was a very good exit. Gave us an ETEX. So uh, we had a company called Persistent Systems, which you'll know, which was a venture cap investment for us. Uh, and that gave us a good 5x. And again, we took an IPO in the market. So uh, we've got a, we've even done a roads company. Like I said, you know, we've got, I mean, we've had 20, 25 exits of, of different, different types. We, we have so far been able to generate a 25% IRR. And a, and a pretty healthy cash on cash investment, um, you know, on this, uh, course, you know, it is quite, uh, it goes up and down, right? So depending on your exits, we've been investors in national stock exchange, which we have partially exited at Forex as well. Uh, we have been in some finance companies like Sriram city union, where you're on the board, that has been a good exit for us. So, so one of the things we do, you realize when you're one fund, right, both in across us and India is that eventually that, you know, you do need to exit, right. You have to sort of, if they are exiting well in the U S we also have to exit in India. So, so, um, and what we've tried very hard as a fund to do is very, be very humble and not be too greedy. Right, because so so when things have hit their IRR and when the right point has come, we have been happy to say that okay, somebody else sees a better price. Uh, you know, we have done our job. We have built a company to help build a company to a certain level. Uh, this is the right time. Leave enough money on the table and and exit. So so we have always been willing to do that, and I think uh, uh, that has helped us a little bit. So thanks so much, uh, Niren. This was really wonderful. We overshot by forty minutes. Yeah, and I noticed. While, while now I'm tired of asking questions, but you don't seem tired at all. No, I mean, look, one of the things I must say, everyone who's hung on till so long that uh, I draw my energy from the entrepreneurial world and I really enjoy chatting with people. I'm a big fan of anyone who's entrepreneurial. If I was not doing this, I would be an entrepreneur myself. And I sincerely wish you all the best in a very, very tough time. Uh, you know, I'm very certain that you will come out looking amazing. If there's anything I can help with, uh, just let me know. And it's been a true privilege. If I could not answer your question, uh, I'm truly sorry. Uh, but I've tried my best to keep give very realistic answers and not offend anyone. Uh, so, you know, I've just been very as honest as I could. So please don't shoot me for that. So this was a super uh, webinar. This was super. You answered very well, very frankly, and a very large number of uh, questions and fields you have, uh, uh, you know, talked about. So on behalf of Thai Mumbai, on my own behalf, on behalf of all the uh, participants who joined today, uh, we really grateful to you. Thanks a lot. And uh, I know you are a great supporter of Thai Mumbai and we look right. forward to your joining us uh, more often. I will be delighted to do that. It's been a privilege and just thank you everyone. Really appreciate it. Uh, Try so my best. for uh, giving us one of the finest webinars we've had till date. Thank oh, you. Thank you, Atul. You did a fantastic job. Thank you very much. Thanks, Niren. And okay. thanks to all the participants who have been hanging on till the end. Yeah.
Yeah, thank you, okay. everyone. And uh, Niren, thank you very much. This has been one of our spectacular webinars. Thank you, Atul Bhai. And Niren, uh, is there a way people could get in touch with you or your company? Uh, yeah, uh, so I'm at, I'm at nshah at nvp.com. Email is nshah at nvp.com. Mm -hmm. I'll just put it on the chat, maybe. And uh, I mean, I say we, are, we look more at, uh, you know, the, the one challenge is we look more at Series B and beyond. So a lot of people write to us on Series A or seed funding. Uh, that won't be an area of interest for us, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, so, but yes, if you're Series B or beyond, we would love to engage or connect. Uh, I'm also available on LinkedIn, but it is very hard because of the sheer amount of traffic. So you can connect with me on LinkedIn. It's at Insha Wazan. But I have not been very good, very candidly to respond to because I get, you know, 500 messages a day. So I have not been very good at responding to messages there. So I've uh, sort of given you my email. I've given you my LinkedIn, um, you know, and sure. I that, think that's, that's about it. That's yeah. good enough, uh, Niren. I think people understand, you know, that you'll be inundated with requests. So thanks yeah. once again. And if there is any other sector, Niren, that has been left out or something, maybe we'll do a side chat later sometime. Sure. I'm happy to come back anytime, Naveen. So whenever you guys tell me, I mean, let me know. I will be back. Sure. Thanks a lot. And folks, okay. uh, we'll have this on YouTube as soon as possible. And these are our upcoming events as always. Uh, we have a pretty packed next week as well. And uh, also please start uh, writing to us for all the one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions, especially to do with your cash flows and operational issues. We have a couple of companies and uh, charter members who are ha happy to help you all out. And our Pi Academy is starting out uh, various sessions for entrepreneurs. Uh, and I think that's also almost getting sold out. So please take a look at that. And having said that, thanks a lot. Uh, this has been one of our longest webinars. And, and it was <clears> very smooth. You know, nobody realized that an hour and 40 minutes had passed. So thanks again. Thank you, Atulbhai, for making it really, really nice. And uh, over to you all. Stay safe and see you soon. Thank you. Thanks, guys. All the best. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.